What is up, Socceristas, and welcome back to the Big Life Podcast, where you're hearing from two 2-0 two co-hosts of right now. Both games have happened. First weekend is in the books. Jordan, tell me all about your first weekend. We came out with a win against Cincinnati for our home opener, um, and then did it again this Sunday against Bowling Green with a nice 3-1 to one win on senior night. We will get all into this, this episode of the podcast. Sometimes college soccer will throw some things at you. The Iowa soccer team got hit by a bunch of that this week we went down to florida gulf coast for our first game uh down in fort Myers, florida and naturally we got hit by some lovely florida weather so that meant that our 7 p.m kickoff we get to the field to go warm up and as soon as we step off the bus we get hit by lightning delay how do you adjust from that man i mean frankly being in the midwest shockingly i haven't had to deal with many lightning delays throughout my entire career i remember saying i'm like if we get this game in tonight we're winning because we just had the best mentality through the entire delay. I have videos of my team. I might have to put some in there of us playing like stupid games, of us doing karaoke to pass the time of how do you like stay mentally engaged enough and ready to go? We kicked off at like 10 o'clock at night. So a three hour lightning delay wrapped up at around 11.45 with a nice win, crawled into my bed around one and at 4 a.m. my alarm went off to catch our flight home. So a bit of a sleep deprived day for Iowa soccer, but you know, through that, like the amount of memories of us sleeping in the North Carolina airport, a couple of very delusional things that we thought were absolutely hysterical that looking back are not funny at all. And, you know, got ready for the next game. So that's like the cyclical nature of the season. It just keeps going no matter what happens. Sunday, we're ready to play. We're at our home opener against UMKC, ready to go. Fully through warmups, like captains are being called. And then all of a sudden our medical staff walks into the field and said it was too hot for us to play. So we have officially been through 45 minutes of warming up. We're all sweating. We're ready to go. They're like, nope, you're not going to get this game in right now. Game got pushed back till 730. So six and a half hour delay. We had to basically go home, get a little nap in, like turn off your brain from game mode. We had like a family barbecue planned for after the game that got turned into our pregame meal and then went and played. So it was really chaotic. And First of all, I, you got to give credit to the UMKC team who agreed to stay an extra night in the hotel, be late for their first day of school in order to get the game in and play at 730 when they were supposed to play at one and be on the road. It was a good game under the lights, but very unexpected for us. Just typical college soccer, like you said, no matter what it throws at you, it just keeps going. So really impressive to both teams for being able to handle that. Yeah, absolutely. It was a crazy bit of a delay, but you never know what's going to happen in college soccer. So that was, I think, a first dose. And Frankly, we have a young team. We need to learn that adversity before going into the height of season. So I'd rather experience it now. This podcast is coming out on Thursday. We have our big rivalry game against Iowa State on Thursday at the University of Iowa. And it's supposed to be super hot again then. We'll see what happens. And you're ready to roll with anything that I can make do. For us over here, we had our game, two home games, Cincinnati Bowling Green. And now we are packing our bags. We leave at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Colorado should be fun, though. Okay, so speaking of, we clearly hear how our weekends went, but it also was an eventful week in college soccer and in Big Ten soccer. Some big upsets already happened, so there's a couple like games I know that caught my eye that I feel like we need to shout out. Outside of our conference, you know, there's always big things happening. First of all, uh, the University of Milwaukee tying number three Notre Dame in the last 30 seconds. That was a crazy one that I know when our team like looked at Twitter after our game, we were like, oh, like, really? I think definitely that was the one that caught most of our eye. Notre Dame, just an absolute powerhouse. Uh, seeing that scoreline, I wish I would have watched the game now. All the clips on Twitter and everything afterwards. But I think that was the big one that I was just, like you said, what the heck? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, in the Big Ten as well, we had Penn State tie North Carolina 0-0. So that was a top 10 matchup. And honestly, that's probably exactly how I saw that game going. They're both two great teams, hard teams to play against. So I think a tie, I didn't watch the game at all, in all fairness, but it seems like it would be a fair result. It'll be super interesting to see as the season goes, you know, games will start ramping up. There'll be more and more upsets. And I mean, I think Jordan will be the first to agree that it's hard to win in college soccer. That's one of the first things you learn is winning is tough. Anything can happen on any given day. There is no guarantees in this sport. Nothing can be taken for granted and any day, anything can happen. Absolutely. All it takes is one moment and you could be dominating the entire time. And all it takes is the other team to get one slip pass in one moment. And, you know, that's the scoreline. So everyone's good. Everyone plays at a high level. It is so hard to be able to dominate a game and win it completely. 
like you said, you saw Notre Dame and Milwaukee tie, like some crazy score lines, you know, just one phenomenal moment from a team and that's it. Well, of course, this is the Big Life podcast, so we have to talk about all things Big Ten and some big stuff happened this week in the Big Ten conference with the Big Ten preseason standings dropping. So Jordan, what are your first thoughts on that? I'm a little, little butthurt about it, you know? We went undefeated, Big Ten champs, not to brag, but, you know, to come in at number four beneath some teams that we had pretty, you know, consistent wins against, you know, we have beaten Northwestern, I think, every time we've played them so far. So to see them ranked at number two is tough to swallow. It's a fire under our butts a little bit there. Penn State is typically always going to come out as one of the favorites. They did win the tournament, so I'm not surprised to see them in that spot. Uh, Rutgers, another good team that you're always going to see in the top. Mixed feelings about number four. It's an amazing preseason ranking. Uh, You know, not too shabby at all, but like to get that maybe a little bit higher as the season goes. You know, okay, I will say I 100% called it that we were going to come in at 10. Um, It was something we were kind of joking about earlier. We're like, where are we going to come in? And I was like, 10th. And I'll be the first to say it. I think I was always a little underranked. Uh, In my opinion, we're a tough team to play against. We didn't perform last year. We know we didn't perform last year. So that's exactly where I saw us coming in. That being said, we got a new team this year and it's only motivation. We saw that 10 immediately I was sent our team group chat saying that this is what people expect out of us and we're about to prove them wrong for us it's kind of like it's a chance it's an opportunity and frankly we thrive when we don't have expectations on us a lot of the time so we saw it but we're ignoring it and we're gonna write our own path and not let other people dictate that for us yeah absolutely great mentality kind of like what we talked about last week with all the other rankings as much as this means doesn't mean anything. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a big thing. I think we hear so much, especially right in the beginning of the season and right at the end of the season about all these awards, all these rankings, all this stuff coming out. And I'm happy they do it for soccer. Don't get me wrong. You want the hype. You want to see, you know, if I'm some random guy that goes to my school or some random person and I'm like, oh, like our soccer team's ranked top in the Big Ten. Maybe I'll go out to a game. Whatever that is, I totally get why they do these preseason stuff, but also Frankly put, there's no real legs for any of it to stand on. It's all a presumption of like what you said last year. You were 17, but that was last year's team for you. You have new faces. You have new opportunity. We've trained for months and months without that. No one's seen us except for last November. So as much of all these recognitions are great and I see, you know, a hype behind it. And that's awesome to get individuals and teams recognized. There's also not a lot of merit to it. In a lot of situations, I think a lot of people take it in as one ear and out the other. Absolutely. And like we talked about, every team is good when you play them. It's so hard to win. The Big Ten Conference, that margin gets so much smaller, right? Any team can win on any given day, no matter where they stand within this ranking. So everything's up in the air and every team is new coming in from last year. So, you know, I think you put it very, very well. This is last year's rankings, last year's teams. And I'm looking forward to see where this falls when games are actually being played. Absolutely. We talked about preseason rankings, and when you were talking about the game, you mentioned how your captains were called. Congratulations, officially being named captain. I'm sure it's not a surprise to you, but I got to see that post come through. So um, round of claps for you. Congratulations. In addition, you got your fourth Big Ten Player to Watch Award. Holy crap. Like, that is a major, major accomplishment. Congratulations. But you got to stop hyping me up. We're supposed to be rivals here. People aren't going to, like, believe in the whole rivalry if we're just talking about each other like this. We're supposed to pick it for the podcast. I mean, fair enough, fair enough. This is all fake. It's not a real relationship. Um, okay, well, first of all, thank you. Out of those two, I would say my biggest honor is team captain. This is my second year now as team captain of the University of Iowa women's soccer team. And just that recognition within my team that they have that faith in me and that belief in me means so much. And that they see that leadership quality in me means the world to me to be with these girls and play my last season with them. So I wouldn't have it anyway. And yes, this is my fourth time uh, being recognized as a preseason all Big Ten or Big Ten to watch which once again is great. And I'm really, really thankful. That being said, like I'll be the first to say I've never once gotten a postseason award. So for preseason, never postseason. So like we said, this is a guess. It's an expectation. And, you know, it's something to keep chasing and keep climbing for. I love the recognition. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to say I didn't. But that being said, it was cool. It was for last year. What can I do this year? So I know that's where mentally I'm at. I'm excited about it, but time to prove it on the field. 
nonetheless, congratulations. <laughs> well, thank you. Talking about all of this, also, you just talked about Captain. I want to talk about some different things that different programs do. You know, obviously, Jordan and I can only speak for Iowa and Michigan State. Those are the two programs we're familiar with. We're around every single day. But every college soccer program has a different unique thing. You know, everyone has a different style, a different culture, a different belief. One of which is, you know, this year I was named one of three captains. I'm the two, one consecutive captain from last year carrying over to this year. You don't have team captains. So can you talk more about how your why your program doesn't do that or what your program does instead? I believe the story goes, Jeff, when he was coaching back all the way at Alma, he had picked captains and it became more of a popularity contest. You picked girls that were just seniors and that played a lot of minutes. It had nothing to do with actual leadership skills or things like that. And things kind of went wrong. You weren't picking captains that should be captains because they had leadership qualities. So he got rid of them. He got rid of them. I don't think he ever had them at Grand Valley. And I know he hasn't had them ever at Michigan State here. It brings a unique dynamic. Everyone has different roles. You can be a freshman. You can be a transfer. Any grade level that comes into this program is expected to hold themselves with the ability to, to lead. And they have that opportunity now rather than just looking at certain individuals to kind of pave the way. You know, everyone shares that responsibility and can do it in any given moment. So, you know, it's it's a really, really cool dynamic that we have, especially with the amount of transfers that we bring in and the number of freshmen we have where they're able to feel comfortable and to be able to have those types of roles where normally they may you know wait a little bit or they may not want to step on any toes or things like that. Um, I think by getting rid of that role and position, it allows everyone to lead collectively that's really cool definitely like I can see how that can fit into a program and how you know in certain times we could have benefited from something like that so you know speaking of you made me sparked a question do you guys do a lot of stuff with like seniority like seniors eat for seniors freshmen do this anything like that like how's your program think about that kind of stuff Nothing. They make it a very, you know, clear statement when you first get there that everyone will help out with, you know, the gear collection, things like that. Everyone was welcome to eat at any given time. We try our best to kind of get rid of that. The only thing we're maybe, you know, too stubborn about is kind of bus seats. Uh, freshmen still sit in the front, you know, not that it's forced, but just kind of happens every time that seniors in the back, freshmen in the front. But other than that, there really isn't any type of seniority role. Everyone is just one big team. I 100% agree. And I'm so thankful that we have that at Iowa too. My freshman year, we actually didn't. We did a little bit more of seniority stuff of like, Freshmen are the ones expected to take the gear off the bus and seniors ate first in line. And I remember like, frankly put, as a freshman that had a role on the team that wasn't a starting lineup, I didn't feel equal. And not that I should feel equal to everyone, but like I, I get that people would put a lot of time in the program that I was new, but I also am working my butt off for this team and I didn't feel like a full part of it. We're all a team, we're all a family, we're a unit. So I know a lot of programs still have this whole seniority thing of, all this stuff, but I'm so thankful that it's something that we don't have. And frankly put, I think it just makes everyone a little bit closer. I remember being a freshman in that awkward position of like, oh, I have to like sit back and wait for everyone else to eat before I ate. And it's just kind of like, you know, I didn't have those fun memories of joking around in line, waiting for food, or we are the same. I will say we have our bus seating. That doesn't change. Um, oldies in the back, freshman in the front. Like you said, it's just kind of something that happens. But Beyond that, it is very, very much, you know, we are one program, we're one unit, and I'm so, so thankful for that. So, you know, as someone who might be younger listening to this podcast, thinking about what they're looking for in a college program, the things like I would look for now, I would never know to look for that. Um, you know, there's so many different like intricacies that I've learned about programs and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like you said, it's something so small that you would never think to ask, but it makes the biggest difference. Um, you know, that you got to experience that freshman year. I know we had it in high school all throughout, which, you know, isn't quite the same, but it's still that disconnect. And that you feel kind of inferior to the rest of the group just because you're younger. Like, it doesn't really make much sense. You're still providing and producing the same amount as them to the program. And to be a put kind of, you know, below them and have them be put on a pedestal for no other reason than age doesn't really make much sense. It's a small thing, but it makes a big difference in a program. I'm really happy that Michigan State, you know, doesn't have something like that. Absolutely. So Jordan, we've brought up this word a lot, and I feel like it is something that comes out a lot in soccer and college sports in general. It's the idea of a role. 
And what does that mean? Every player kind of has their own and sometimes can help factor what your role is, but you don't always get a say in what your role. So as a player, as someone who's been through the ringer, what are your kind of thoughts on what role even means to you and your team? It's a really, really good question. I would say that my career has been kind of anything but smooth. It's been a roller coaster for sure, you know, from the moment I've got here and my role has been constantly changing and I'm constantly juggling trying to figure out what it is. When I started this podcast, I didn't want to just give you kind of all the bright sides and recruit you to Michigan State. You know, that's not the reason for this. I wanted to give you guys the reality of what being a college athlete was. Um, Good, bad, and ugly. And right now, I'm kind of going through it. You know, as a junior, for the first time in my career, I find myself training before a game because I know I'm not going to get super significant minutes. I had a really, really great role on the team last year. Um, I had seven goals and three assists five of which being in conference, four of them being game winners, like no small feat. Like I I was a significant player on a team that went undefeated winning the conference. I'm the lead scorer returning to the team. And I only say this because everything was pointing to the fact that like I should be a star this year. You know, I was I was set up for success. Um, and in our first game, I played nine minutes. Our second game, I played five. My role is undefined. You know, it's not what you expected. It is... I'm still trying to figure that out, you know, trying to show what a good example of someone who, you know, is an upperclassman, not getting what they want, you know, taking everything in stride here. It's a really strange thing where your role is constantly changing day to day. I haven't really figured out mine yet in this, you know, new position. So I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't exactly, exactly know how I would define it. It's just, an everyday thing trying to figure out how you can best support your team with what you got. You know, you can only control yourself. You can only control so much. How can you take what you were given and make it the best scenario you can for not only you personally, but for your team and support them? Yeah, that's, first of all, I want to thank you. I feel like we're media trained. Let's be real here. You know, when you're interviewed by someone that you're going to give the best answer of how we're all trained to give the best answer. So you being willing to come on here and say to everyone that you're in an unexpected position is really freaking great. Honestly, I wasn't going to come on here and ask. That was not what my intention was going to be. But Jordan, you know, before this podcast said, this is what I want to talk about. And that's amazing. Because this is real. This is college soccer is not linear. You know, you can judge college soccer by stats all you want. That doesn't show a picture. And you can judge, you know, a person based on their stats. And that doesn't show who they are as a player or a teammate. As a program, we discuss roles all the time. And how do you bring value to the group? And what is value? You know, there's so many of these questions. And I think the biggest thing, and I think Jordan just nailed it on the head, is expectation. As a freshman coming in or as a girl who just committed to a school or someone that wants to play college soccer even, I can say I had expectations of my freshman year. I was going to come in my freshman year. I was going to play minutes. I was going to be a heavy minute player. I was going to get newcomer of the year and that was going to start my career. I was confident in that. That was my expectation. There's just something to the reality of getting knocked on your butt and how do you get picked up? I'll be completely honest. I'm in a very different position from Jordan right now. Through my Iowa soccer career, I did start every single game my freshman year. I played a lot of minutes my freshman year, and that has ticked up ever since to a point where I've started all but one game in my Iowa soccer career. And she, you know, played 14 minutes this weekend. I played 180. I didn't come off the field. That being said, roles still matter. How we adjust those things and expectations still matter. Because guess what? I played all those minutes my freshman year. I still didn't get newcomer of the year, not even for the University of Iowa. We've joked already on this podcast, I've been a four-time preseason player, never a post-season player. Our expectations of what you want and what you expect, frankly, won't be met in a lot of different scenarios. So how do you deal with that? How do you be a good teammate in that? How do you support your program in that? And frankly, I think that that shows more about how you be a teammate through the adversity and what you give to your program versus if you're a good soccer player or not, because everyone can be good but are you good for your program? And that's really a question that I would challenge a lot of people to start thinking about if they are or aren't happy with what their playtime is or where they are in the field right now. Absolutely. I think you nailed it on the head with expectation. I think that's where a lot of the struggles come in when the role you're given doesn't meet 
what you expected it to be. You know, when you're not getting the minutes you expected, things like that, that's when you can get a lot of the disappointment and kind of just that toxic environment that kind of builds. And I've been really lucky because this is hard, right? None of this is easy. This is not what I wanted my junior year to start as. Everyone wants to play. Everyone wants to be a starter. Of course, like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, thank God, (laughs) you know, I'm on the bench. You know, that's just not the reality of it. It is hard. So having teammates that hold you accountable to not let those kind of negative thoughts seep in, because it's a constant battle between, you know, every decision that's made, looking at it, you know, half empty or half full. Like those negative thoughts, even though I maybe am able to stay positive in the moment, you know, they still kind of creep in in moments and you really easy to get sucked into just how much things suck right so having teammates that hold you accountable to be like yeah okay like shut up like go go like let's go get on the ball let's go run some more like let's get you to where you need to be like you can't just sit here and feel sorry for yourself you know hopefully I can hold others accountable in that same way where even though my expectations aren't being met, my role is able to still be one that adds a positive value to this team, even from, you know, the sidelines or whatever this may look like. I'll go a bit into a story for me, but frankly, that's a lesson I didn't learn until my sophomore year. I was fortunate enough to be the freshman that was on the field. I thought I was everything, man, after my freshman year. I'll be the first one to say it. I was like, oh, freshman year in the book, start every game in a power five school. I'm great. And sophomore year, we absolutely sucked, man. I'll be the first one to say it. It was 2021. It was the spring of COVID year. And we finished conference play two, seven, and one. Um, worst season in Iowa soccer history. But then that was the Big Ten year. And that was the year that everyone, because of COVID, made the Big Ten tournament. We kind of saw it as a different shot. And I won't go into all my details of this crazy story, but we went on a run. And we somehow got to a point where we were playing in the semifinals against Penn State at Penn State, who was number four in the country at the time. Around the 50th minute of the game, we go up 1-0. And then in the 65th minute of the game, I got my second yellow card of the game. You know, I'm assuming most people listen to this podcast know soccer, but basically that meant that I got a red card and I had to go off the field and my team played down a man for the rest of that game against number four in the country in the Big Ten semifinals on their home turf. And until that moment, I think I viewed soccer as an individual sport. High school, frankly, a lot of the time, like I'll be the first to say it. Yes, your team matters 100%. You should be a team player, but you do have so many individual goals. At least I did. Yeah, of course I wanted my team to do well, but I wanted to go play college soccer, but I wanted to get better at this because I have these goals that are even higher than high school soccer or whatever I was at at the time. And so it's really hard to balance that. You know, how do you be a good teammate and all that stuff? And I feel like that's not something you really learn until something gets thrown in your face. And for me at that point, everything in my career was, you know, slowly ticking up. And in that moment, I remember I was at my rock bottom and my parents were at that game. And I remember looking at my in the stands at my parents and I sat down on the bench for a second and I was just sobbing because it was my fault that the team was down a man. And now I was off the field and this also sunk in. I'm like, if we make the Big Ten championship game, my first game, I'm not going to start my Iowa soccer career is the Big Ten championship. Like that, that was a hard pill to swallow. In that moment, I remember I have two options here. I can sit here and cry on the bench and I don't think anyone will blame me for that. No one would be mad at me for that. Or I can stand up again, I can cheer. And no part of me wanted to cheer. I was completely at my low, but like I stood up and the joke is I was like running more on the sideline than people were on the field. That was a transformative moment in my life. And it was the first time I think I could ever say I viewed soccer as fully a team sport. And I wanted to do everything in my power in that moment to be what was best for the team. And that had nothing to do with being on the field. For the Big Ten Championship, I couldn't even wear my jersey but we had to win. There was no doubt that we were going to win that game for us. And I will say my team, I was so thankful, recognized the pain I was going through, but also the effort I was putting in to not let that feel. So when we won the big 10 championship and they gave us the trophy, like my team pushed me forward to go accept it because they knew how much it meant to me, even though I wasn't on the field. And I only just tell that story to explain to people that are listening, like, Your role doesn't have to be on the field. People, I feel like all the time you think, oh, you're a role player. That means you get minutes. That means you do this. Like I think of the incredible teammates I'd have that uh, that are on our team that have been injured their entire careers, unfortunately, and are some of the best teammates we have. Because guess what? When I have a bad practice, I know that that girl is going to be there to give me the hug. And that girl is going to tell me, hey, get your stuff together. Like they know what you need. Being a role player doesn't have to be spending time on the field. It doesn't have to be that. It means being committed to a program and being committed to a team. And roles change. 
Roles can change in seconds. So how do you adjust? How can you adjust to be ready to flip and do both things that your program needs you to do at that time? And like you said, roles change, right? So last year I was similar spot. You know, I didn't have a great preseason, limited minutes. I wasn't sure what to do. And by the end of the year, NCAA tournament, I'm starting and playing all 90 minutes, right? Like it's, it's anything but linear in terms of college soccer. It's always up and down and staying committed to the program. Even when things aren't going well is when you're going to see kind of that upward trajectory of success, even if it's not in terms of minutes, but in terms of your team dynamic and that feel and that, you know, just overall joy you get from being a part of this program when you know you're committing something to it when you're adding value to it whether or not it's on the field or you know off of it I really hope that in Jordan and I made this podcast to be your soccer older sisters to be the girls that have been through this that wish that they had the answers when they were finding their programs when they were finding out what college soccer was even like so as someone listening to that when you're recruiting and going through the phase of you know trying to figure out what school might be best for you Look at a program where you would thrive when you're not on the field. That's one of the first questions my parents told me when it came to recruiting and thinking about going to wherever I was going to go is, will you be happy if you're not on the field? Is these Are these people that you want to spend your time with? You know, there's so much that you can talk about being on the field for college soccer, and that's all great. And yeah, you want to have the moment. But let me tell you, the first, first thing that you will forget is the goal that you scored, and you'll remember the locker room after or those times with your friends or the silly bus rides. So you want to find a program that you can be committed to through all this. Because guess what? Like, I'll be the first to say the transfer portal is booming right now. We all know it. Let's call it like it is. There's a lot of people who are throwing their names in the portal because of frustrations here or there. Maybe they just didn't find the program that they wanted to commit to, that they were going to give their all in. You know, I'll be the first to say there is talk of me maybe not taking my fifth year at Iowa. But for me personally, that was never an option because I committed to the University of Iowa in 2016. That was when I gave my verbal commitment to Dave Deani that I was going to be a Hawkeye and I was going to finish my college career as a Hawkeye. Yes, we've had ups and downs. We've won a Big Ten tournament and we finished ninth in the Big Ten. I am a Hawkeye. So finding a program that you are willing to say that to and put that on you, that's pride for me. And I think not a lot of girls are taking a lot of pride in that recruiting process right now. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That is a great point. Michigan State is, you know, no stranger to the transfer portal. We have a lot of girls come in and, you know, we've had our few go out of the program. It's, it's such an intimate dynamic. I feel like between you and the school, you go to the coaching staff, the players, the teammates, and hopefully we can give you a little bit more insight into maybe some of the questions you guys can ask or the things you can look for to help navigate that. And hopefully you do find your right fit. And if not, there is no, you know, shame in the transfer portal you know if you don't if you aren't somewhere where you can give that commitment to where you can actually feel like you're providing to your program that you're feel happy at then it, it isn't the right fit for you and you should you know probably go find somewhere where you can have that type of joy and accomplishment we got lucky enough that we found the right schools right away um not everybody has that yeah, that's a great point, Jordan. And I definitely don't want to add any shame to the transfer portal by any means. So that was I was really, really well worded and judging off of me for that. So I appreciate that. You know, it's just it's an interesting dynamic to follow along in college soccer right now. It's something that I think a lot of us have had our eyes on and just kind of like there's a lot of questions going out about it. So like we said, this is an unfiltered podcast. No one is telling us what to say or how to do it. So this is definitely the the unscripted version, which I think we're both really proud of sharing. I'm gonna ask a very personal question. How are you doing? with juggling the fact that your role is changing how does that feel and what are you relying on for that it feels different not even by the day but like by the hour to be you know lay it all out there I had a pretty significant injury when I was in Australia to my ankle um, due to both the degree of injury and the circumstances surrounding it the fact that I was in another country I was out I was out for longer than I would have hoped to be out for you know I missed a good chunk of the summer I wasn't actually cleared until the first day of season so August 2nd when we were training back at Michigan State my ankle is fully healed now but now you're dealing with all the repercussions of me not being on the ball being on the field game fitness my touch is off I'm rusty things like that like I talked about everything was set up looking at last year if you're just speculating you know, just taking that last chunk of last year, I I should be starting, I should be a star, I should have everything going for me right now. And it's just not the reality, right? Like I am getting the fewest minutes I ever have in college soccer, I'm training before games now I'm at, you know, essentially the lowest I have been in my career, just performance wise. It's a really, really 
tough pill to swallow. I got really lucky with the coaching staff I have. Jeff, through some of last year's trials and tribulations, we've gained a relationship. We're able to have honest conversations about what's going on and what it looks like. So I've been really lucky to have that relationship that kind of helping me get through it. He has to remind me every so often where I practice, whatever it is, like I have a bad touch, what a, that looks like, where I just, you can see me kind of get down on myself where I'm like, I'm never going to come back and he'll pull me aside and be like, you're still a big part of this program. Your role has changed, but like I said before, like that doesn't mean I'm not a plus, right? That I'm, I'm bringing the team down or anything like that. Like I'm not worthless because, you know, I played a bad ball. And sometimes I do need some reminding of that. I think I am my biggest critic by far. It's really easy to just kind of get down on myself and to fall through a rabbit hole where I'm just like, this sucks. Um, I've had teammates hold me accountable with that or just, you know, navigate the conversation where like, you're good. Like, it's okay. And I've definitely needed some of that. It's just, it's been hard. It's been really, really weird. It's been a weird navigation process where I'm hyping. I'm like, I can do it. I'm going to get back. It's, oh my God, I suck. And then you rewind again. It's just been a roller coaster of that, but trying to remain um, consistently positive and be able to still be there for my team. I'm only on the field for five minutes. So for 85 of it, trying to be the loudest, most cheeriest person I can be, which is way out of my nature, by the way, I am an introvert by heart, but being able to be there and still support my teammates, support the forwards who are going in and getting minutes, being like, what's the scout look like? Like, what are you seeing? Like, hopefully I can give them some ideas on the sideline, trying to find ways where I can still fit in as part of an immediate impact on the team without actually being on the field. So it's been, how do I feel? I don't know. <laughs> I'm still figuring it out, but I, I'm looking forward to where hopefully this journey goes. You know, it's the most adversity I've faced thus far, and I'm sure or I hope that at least, you know, I'll overcome it and you'll see me back on the field again soon. But this is where we're at right now. Like, this is what it is. How do I, how do you navigate it? I mean, once again, like, Thank you for saying all this because I feel like we get we get the scripted version so often, you know, and you could sit on here and say, yeah, I'm great and everything's fine because I'm so happy for the teams. And not that you're not, but, you know, it's a lot. I'll fully say, like, I've had moments in my career where I'll be the first to say, like, I was successful on the outside, but where I was at emotionally didn't set me up for anything and it didn't make me feel anything. I had this conversation with a freshman the other day who was managing her expectations and you know she came in being like I thought I was going to be the it girl as a freshman and that hasn't happened. And I go, "You know what? I'm going to be so real with you right now like I was fortunate enough to be that it girl if you want to give it a label. You know, like I said I started every game my freshman year on a team that had 14 seniors. I kicked the senior off of her starting lineup to get that spot for me. It was a lot of really positive things on the outside but I was not in a place emotionally. I wasn't tough enough. And by that, I really want to speculate. I do not mean mentally tough because I think mentally tough is one of the most BS sayings that there is in sport. Because what does that mean? I was at a point where I understood mentally tough to be that I had no emotions, that I was stronger than everyone else because I was mentally tough. I couldn't feel anything. And that put me at my lowest level. I was playing a ton of minutes. I was supposed to be this person, but I can tell you, I came home after every single game and I rewatched film and I would just cry. And it's something that as athletes, we are, we do tend to be our hardest critics. You know, we tend to be perfectionists because guess what? We've given 20 years of our lives to this sport. We love this sport. So how do you not? But I really want to just think about the fact that like, I was telling this freshman, I go, I was at that picturesque point that you feel like you want to be at but nothing was good enough because mentally I wasn't there. I didn't, you know, I kept chasing and kept chasing. I couldn't feel the success. I couldn't feel the pride because I couldn't understand that. So when we're talking about, you know, how we're feeling, like it's everyone, like everyone in college soccer, I can nearly guarantee has felt this way at some point in their career. And I just want to put that out there because I don't feel like enough people understand that. Like I thought I was the only one that felt that way. And I thought, who am I to feel that way? Because I am starting and I am playing. So who do I think I am? That's selfish of me. And I just want everyone to know that those feelings are also valid. They're not going to help you play your best. I'll be the person to say that. And there needs to be a time of how do we intervene? You know, I'll say it. I went to our sports psychologist and I sat in her office a lot trying to process everything and trying to figure out what that meant for me. Everyone needs their own outlet, but every feeling that you have is valid. And I feel like that's something that we're not told enough as athletes. 
Absolutely. I like could not have put that better. I love that you brought up the mental toughness piece because that's a really quick answer that everyone loves to give you when things aren't going well. You need to be mentally tough. Like you said, what what does that mean? You know, like can you there's no formula for it. It's just a saying people like to throw at you. Um, and you mentioned the sports psychologist. So Michigan State, we have our own personal one that we bring in. You have mandatory meetings with him. You have optional ones if you would like to continue the process um, or do additional work with him. We call him Skeets. He's worked with some of the best athletes in the world. So we get really fortunate that we're able to have access to him. And I think he's been really useful too as an outlet to help kind of navigate some of these just just negative emotions and to deal with the adversity that this is my personal one that I have shared with you guys that I'm going through. But every single person on that field, like you said, 90 minute players, starters, they everyone goes through it at some point. Um, I've been fortunate, unfortunate, just it is what it is enough to have gone through, I think, every single experience throughout my college career thus far of being you know, imposter syndrome where I feel like I should be playing less than what I am. I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. Or to be on the other end where I don't feel like I'm getting what I deserve as a player. I'm better than what my minutes are showing. You know, I've been satisfied in my career where maybe I wasn't motivated enough to go out and do things that were needed or really just have that type of mental toughness to go through it and do the extra work, that greediness. That's the word I'm looking for. The greediness to like go out on the field. Um, I just became kind of satisfied with what I was getting, uh, which isn't good either. You know, you still want to strive for more and for success. So no matter what those minutes look like or what that picture looks like for you, like those emotions, that type of mental health, you know, everyone, everyone experiences it. So you're not alone. And we just, we both go to sports psychologists, you know, so whatever, do what you need to do and whatever that looks like, uh, just know you're not alone. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this conversation, frankly, got a lot deeper than I think anyone who tuned in was expecting. Deeper than I was expecting, but I'm so thankful we had it. And this is the platform that we've been giving. And I'm proud to share the realness with you all. So Jordan, what does your next week, you said you got Colorado. What's the week look like? Who are we playing? What are we looking forward to? So this week is full of Colorado. We leave tomorrow at 9 a.m. We'll train there and everything. Uh, Thursday, Sunday, we have two games down there. We'll get back like hours before my first class Monday. So then we'll start school in that whole picture as well. But we got a full, what is that, five days, six days in, in Colorado. You know, you're however much higher up in the air you got the elevation to worry about and then just really really hot temperatures so it's going to be interesting it's going to be a whole new mindset the team's going to have to adapt we've got some really really nice team bonding stuff kind of built in there where team lunches I think we go to Jeff's sister's house I want to say it was where you know she'll host us for a nice you know home cooked meal or whatever that is so everyone is actually traveling for this first big week-long trip which you know, it's kind of uncommon. Usually you don't bring the whole roster for long, long trips like this, especially plane rides. So that's really, really exciting. You're going to have all 31 of us away together for a week where you get to add that whole bonding aspect into this, you know, very real intense game situations as well. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great point to make. Um, the travel roster is not a guarantee for anyone. Uh, that's definitely something I don't think a lot of people fully understand when they come to soccer is our college soccer is not everyone does travel everywhere. I'll be the first to say we took 23 on our flight to Florida. So a lot of girls got left home. Uh, and, you know, most of us for like Iowa, the number is 28 on a bus ride, 24 typically on a flight. But, you know, depending on what you're given and what your role is, those things can change. And, you know, obviously you want them change in your favor. How do you guys typically decide? Is there like a deciding point for your travel roster? Or is it just your coach's decision? Or what does that look like for you? Yeah, it's just coaches. They'll send out kind of an email within a certain amount of time before where it has your packing list, your itinerary, and the travel roster all put into that kind of email where it lets you know. Things change game to game depending on what that looks like. I don't know our exact numbers. We take as many as we can depending on budget, type of travel, things of that nature, how long it is. And then they'll go through and coach's decision on who 
makes and doesn't make that roster. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for us, I think our big thing is this is why we have a prescribed fitness test. We talked about that last episode is our first cut to our travel roster is if you're not passing the fitness test. If you're not passing the fitness test, that is the number one reason of why you're going to get cut from a travel roster. In our program, we travel a lot. Our coach travels more than a lot of other coaches do. And so we're extremely lucky that he sees the value in that. And I think as a player and as a part of the program, I do as well. But that's where the expectation of the standards come in for us. And it's a frank conversation, but it's a very tangible piece of controlled what was supposed to be controlled. And that was the number one factor. So, you know, it's been interesting. And I think that's a journey for a lot of people to navigate is what that looks like and how staying home looks like. Obviously, you know, I think you can tell kind of by the tone of this episode, like not everything is roses and butterflies. I am so grateful for the opportunity I have, but it's also real, you know, and I think that's an important part to address in all that as well. For us coming up this week, we have Iowa State. Like I said, big rivalry game. Uh, Cyhawk series is really big in the state of Iowa for anyone that listens. You know, the Iowa, Iowa State, they play each other in every sport that we have in common keep track of the wins across the year it's a big thing in the state of Iowa so we kick it off every year being the first board play Iowa State you know sort of big checking the Iowa tally on the road is a big deal for us and it's a matter of pride for us and both schools involved so you know this will be my fourth time playing Iowa State since we didn't play them in the COVID year when we had no non-conference exhibition plays so we are currently two and one. So two wins, one loss. We lost last year. So it's our turn to take revenge for that. Looking forward to that opportunity. Yeah, good luck to you guys. Thanks so it's much. Good. Keep you all updated on everything. I am so thankful to be here with Jordan. So grateful for her realness and to talk about the real stuff that happens in college soccer. This is your reminder. Please subscribe, download our episodes. We really, really appreciate it. Contact us at sam.carry and Jordan underscore Wickus with any questions. We'd love to add them to the pod. and as always, soccer on. Bye, guys.